It's time for Twitch this week in computer hardware episode 54 for January 20th. Coming up, Ryan Shroud from PC Perspective on laptop gaming, Intel's wireless display, aka Wi-Fi, and why Arendale might come to the Mac first. It's all ahead with Twitch. Netcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch. This week in computer hardware with Ryan Shrout. Episode 54 for January 20th, 2010. Laptop Gaming. This week in computer hardware is brought to you by the new voice activated sync, featuring hands free calling, music, and podcast search and turn-by-turn -turn navigation. Available exclusively on Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury vehicles. For more details, visit SyncMyRide.com. It's time for Twitch! This week in computer hardware, back from Las Vegas, Nevada, our computer hardware guru, Mr. Ryan Shroud with PC Perspective, PCPer.com. Hey, Ryan. How are you? You only got back last night. I only got back last night. Would you stick around? Of, you wanted more pain, suffering? I, I had some uh, recreational days. I actually, I went up to uh, Old Vegas, Fremont Street for the first time. As many times as I've been to Vegas, I've never been up there. You see the so laser kind of, light show and all of that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. to the overhead light show. That was the only place I won money in any casino also. <laughs> really? Uh, Good. Well, what would yeah. you, you play? The slots? Three-card poker. Three-card poker. And I actually hit two straight flushes within about four hands of each other. Oh, you were hot. You were on a roll. Yeah. I, I, they did call the pit boss had to call security uh, like the overhead after I won the second one in four hands um, to make but sure they gave, you me my, they gave me my money and I left. Yeah. Yeah. I would leave as soon as they call security. That's usually <laughs> a sign. They're not yep. happy. It just shows you no one wins in Vegas. If they do, the presumption is you're cheating. Exactly. Exactly. I told the pit boss, please don't fire this dealer. She was really nice. <laughs> just, you know, I'm sorry. And that's why I never gamble there. It's just, a, it's a sucker's it was game. Actually, yeah, it was the only time I had this whole weekend, so yeah. a whole week. You got to do it. So that's great. So your wife came out. She she avoided CES. Yep, yep, yep. And Cleverly uh, enough. Smart woman. And yeah. you had a little vacation. I think that's a great idea. Yep. I figured I was already out there. I had a couple yeah. of meetings on Sunday to get to. She went shopping while I was in those and then... You know, it was a fun little vacation. Good. Ready to get back to work, I guess. So what would you think about CES? Um, overall, I would have to say from a hardware perspective that I thought CES turned out to be uh, more productive, a little bit better than I had thought, uh, at least a little bit better than the last couple of years in terms of uh, seeing new products, new interesting products. There weren't any really major announcements necessarily during the show. But uh, maybe with the exception being in Intel's new processors that they officially launched, uh, the first day of CES, the Clarkdale and the Arendale new Core i or Core i five, well, Core i three parts. And, and this and this Y die, that's new, isn't it? The wireless distri wireless. What does it stand for? It's it sounds for it stands for wireless display. Display. So it's actually pretty cool. Something I hadn't seen yet when we did uh, the show last week. So I wasn't able to cover it. It's called Intel Push to TV. I think this is a great, a great product. We're going to talk about it. In a, uh, should we start talk now, or yeah, well, actually before we do? I yes. see you have it on your list, but before that, you want to you want to pledge your support for Conan. Oh, I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is the only time <laughs> I just posted on my Twitter feed. This is the only time I've ever actually changed my icon for anything, which is kind of sad. You know, people did uh, sure, things. Not for, Iran, not no. Katrina, <laughs> no. not Haiti. No, no, he supports Conan. So what's your, wait a minute, now I've got to go to Twitter. So what is the I support? What is your, it's Ryan Shrout? Uh, what is your Twitter handle? Yeah, Ryan Shrout. And what does uh, the support Conan icon so that's, look like? That's the whole, uh, it's uh, Oh, you put a little, a little Conan head there. Exactly. Put a little Conan O'Brien head there. And that's uh, with the recent late night <laughs> debate with Jay Leno trying to come back and push him out of the way. We yeah, all support Conan. Yeah. Now, how do you? Now, oh, here you can go to a website and add a twibbon. Right. Yeah. This is. I a, believe that's a site that the uh, that you've used before to like kind of automatically modify. Yeah. Or twibbon is is kind of whoever thought this up is brilliant because yeah, basically it doesn't matter what your cause is, you can just take <laughs> your icon and you and you add something to it. it could be late night TV. That's could be right. could be anything. Could, look, it could be Planet Hemp. 
It could be the Gaza Strip. It could be uh, bra color, pink bra. <laughs> it could anything. So and people do that. So I'm going to go there. That's a great idea. Let me let me go Conanize. So how do you do? You say show my support now. And uh, allow Twibbon access. It's going so it's going to actually access my account, and that's it. And now yep. I've been Conanized. You you will have been Conanized. That's all it takes. That's that's my favorite part of it. Is because if I had to actually download the icon and edit something and re-upload it, it would never happen. I wonder if they have a Leno, like a giant chin man, you could, <laughs> or just like you could add your put a giant chin on yourself. That would be pretty cool. You know uh, what? That would actually I, be pretty. Cool. Actually, I, I've still got my Santa hat on from the last Twibbon. I have to de Santa myself. This is <laughs> pathetic. Now I look like I'm crazy. I've got two causes. <laughs> Free Santa. Good. Oh man, I don't. I don't even know how. I how, is there a way to go back? I, you know, I didn't look that far ahead. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, I hope so. I guess I don't know. I, Other I than re upload your if, icon, if I'm if you not have, sure. If you have a, uh, if you have a, oh, you my history. I can go back. Okay. Oh, okay. All right, there you go. I can, Good. I can go back. And I'm going to revert. Oh, look at see. Good to know. Here's the hist my history of twibbing. So I'm going to revert <laughs> to my to my pre Conan Santa hat, and then. Oh, okay. All right. And then I sense. will conify again. I'm going to double. That's a good idea. Yeah, I'll be a double Conan. So, uh, 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 what's the latest? Uh, let's talk about why die. I talked to the Intel rep, and he said we don't call it. Gary said we don't call it why die. But, uh, yeah, I, I saw that. Uh, I've, I've seen that term listed. Well, he explained what happened. Oh, yeah, so, what's that? So Paul Ottolini has been preparing his keynote. They've been pre preparing to talk about, what is it, wireless? See, this is a problem. It's not a good name. Wireless distribution? Wireless? Wireless display. Display. So he's, he's been talking, about, like his speech. It's in the speech, wireless display, wireless display. Like right before he goes on stage, he says, I don't like that. I'm going to call it wide eye. <laughs> Without really thinking about what the hell wide eye could could be taken to mean? Right, exactly. It's kind of uh, unfortunate terminology. Yeah, it makes sense when you see it written out. Well, I'll right? tell you why. Because when you hear wide eye, you know, you, your first reaction is, "Well, why not?" <laughs> exactly. But it's it's not W I D I. Unfortunately, no. yeah, it's actually a really cool technology. But just despite the name, I think this is a, right. I think this is a great idea. And I saw a Sony laptop with wide eye in it. I yep. saw a Dell uh, notebook, very, uh, the Latitude Z, like I bought only the next generation, uh, has, has this. So tell us about it. So uh, I guess the official Intel branding they're calling it is Intel Push to TV, which uh, eh, that's not uh, that much better in my mind either. Because you <sighs> yeah. might be pushing it to non-TVs eventually, to monitors, to external displays of all kinds. So. Right. Um, this is cute. Now my Conan. Now my Conan head. Now that I took the, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've got back. No, I just noticed my uh, my video was going choppy too. I'm so back on just... Conan. My yeah. Conan head now is in my arms. I, it's moved. Interesting. Mm. So, well, hey, at least you're supporting it, right? You're yeah. maybe you're just holding him it, while it, he. Oh, they've ruined it. It's just messed it up. <laughs> oh boy. Anyway. Um, so, uh, the, why the push die? To TV. <laughs> yeah, why die? Push Get me back TV. on track. Very yes. Display. Why die? So, the technology itself is actually pretty, pretty interesting and, and compelling in its own right. So, it, it does come does require very specific laptops right now, and I think there are three of them that are officially launching at Best Buy, the, either this week or this next coming week. One's from Sony, one's from Dell, and I believe the third is from Gateway. I can't remember. I think it's Gateway. I think the third one's from Gateway, so, and then as so the months. A, it's a two well, it's a two piece solution though because you um yes. you get the uh built in kind of wireless display technology mm -hmm. in the laptop but then you also have to have something that attaches to the TV. Right. So what all three of these machines will have is bundled with them a small little box from Netgear. It's the Netgear PVT1000. So push to TV sort of that doesn't really fit I guess the PVT1000. Push VT Right. Yeah. And it has output. It has HDMI output. It has a composite output. I think it might have a component output as well. And then it has a network. No, it would have Wi-Fi connection and obviously a power cord. It has um, HDMI. Yes. So it, goes, now, so it goes right to the TV. So it's kind of like a little Roku box, but all it does is pick up uh, Wi-Fi out of the sky. 
Correct. Oh, it picks up Wi-Fi from your laptop. So what it actually does is the reason you have to have these special notebooks, why you can't necessarily just install new software on your existing machine, is that Intel is saying that it requires uh, their updated Wi-Fi chipset because it actually creates a secondary network that exists only between uh. the the PVT-1000, the Netgear unit, and the laptop itself. So, so it's actually creating like an ad hoc network. It's not really 802.11 then, or...? I, I, I'm not sure. It doesn't, it doesn't, in other words, it doesn't use your router. You, do you it, need it, Wi-Fi for it to work? You, no, you don't, you don't need oh, you Wi-Fi. You don't. So it's no. an ad hoc network. Yeah. Now, if you don't have Wi-Fi, I don't really, I mean, depending on what you're trying to show people, if it's local content, then no, I guess you don't. You don't need to have an actual internet oh. connection or Wi-Fi in that, in that respect because it really does create like a one-to-one -one point to point connection. And then on the, uh, on the wireless Wi-Fi adapter, if you are connected to another network as well, like your Wi-Fi for your internet connection, it does time slicing between them. So that's how it's able to use one radio and, uh, you know, support these two different networks at the same time, which if, if you've ever tried to connect to more than one wireless network at a time, you understand why that's kind of interesting and new, something that, that really, yeah. really wasn't done before. Um, so now there we, are, so the, well, the, I guess the idea behind it's pretty simple. At least on these machines, you push one button. That's kind of their claim to fame. It's one button push and the software communicates, creates up this network, communicates with the Netgear device and it mirrors your display on the TV that it's attached to. Pretty pretty neat. Now there are some... Well, 720p, it's not 1080p, right? 720p, right. yeah. Yeah, so, it, you know, what would you use it for? Watching videos, um, showing well, people what you're Hulu, on them. YouTube, Hulu. yeah, anything you YouTube. could put on your PC, right, it would pick up. Anything you could put on your PC, but there are some it, it, limitations to this first generation that I was kind of surprised to hear weren't fixed or worked out already by NVIDIA. Uh, it does not support HDCP at this point. So, so you copy cannot protected play material. Blu -ray. Yeah, I'm not surprised to be. Oh, yeah, that means you can't play Blu-ray. 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 No, no, no Blu-ray uh, on the push to TV. That's not good. Because of that. So that's kind of annoying because, I mean, that's one of those things where if you got a Blu-ray laptop, um, that's that would be a really great feature to be yeah. able to stream that directly to TV without having it's to hook not it up. Not a surprise. Not at least not have a surprise. to buy another yeah. Blu-ray drive. But also in conjunction with that, you mentioned it does 720p, and that's as, that's as high a resolution as it will transmit right now. Seven is 1280 by 720. Mm -hmm. uh, so you wouldn't be able to, to transmit your Blu-ray in its full resolution anyway, right? So maybe it's not as big of drawback. Right. Right. As it might have at first seemed. So that, the, the 720p resolution is um, a little bit confusing to me as far as why they put that in there. Uh, it would seem to me that 802.11G even, and especially if they're, I don't, I don't know if they're using N necessarily, if they're using N radios in the, the Netgear device, that you'd have more than enough bandwidth to do more than 1080 or do more than 720. Gary was talking to me from Intel. Mm -hmm. Trying to remember, I should have taken notes. He told me, I thought he told me it wasn't, it was G, not M, but he said it could go up to, um, I want to say 18 megabits, which is okay. pretty fast. That should be fast enough to send 1080p, I would think. Maybe not. Yeah, I mean, it depends on, uh, there are other issues involved, right? So if, if it's doing compression before it's sending that signal, uh, uh, they might be limiting it on terms of how fast the processors are going to be in this right. range of notebooks because I mean 18 megabits is I mean we're talking about blu-ray you're going to exceed 18 megabits if you send the raw stream uh, and obviously we all know this is why we're all on wired connections here we don't really trust wireless to keep its bandwidth 100 percent of the time you know 24 hours a day so uh, there, there could be some issues for that I, but I would think they'd be doing some kind of compression they'd be able to send more than that over a local network. Like we'll talk about OnLive later and it supports 720p and it's coming up over your broadband connection, um, not over a wireless, you know, remote or local network it's, itself. So that, that was a little disappointing. Also, um, you don't get the mouse cursor. So uh, it's, it's really only used for mirroring. You only get to mirror your display, your notebook display on, on the TV. Uh, so if you want to do any kind of work on it, the cursor only shows up on your local laptop monitor. It doesn't actually show up on 
the TV screen, when I kind of asked why, they said basically there are some latency issues that they were still trying to work around in that regard. So it doesn't seem like you'll be able to use wireless oh, I display. See. As a use it as a t monitor. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so really, it's just to display the video that's on the, on the screen. Right. So it'll, sh I mean, it will show whatever's on your screen. Uh, but there was a, you know, somewhat noticeable difference between what was showing on, you know, if you're watching a video, what frame was showing locally versus what frame was showing on 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 the TV, for example. So that 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 also is a little bit confusing to me trying to figure out, you know, I, I've used VNC on a local network before and never really had problems using the local mouse cursor and that kind of stuff. So it does it does um, raise some questions to me as far as what technology they're using, how much processing they're doing locally before sending it out, because right. that could also cause the latency, the delay they're saying if they are compressing the video before sending it out um, in that regards. But it's a great again, idea, though. I mean, because for, 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 for the average Joe, not you and me, because we, we may have other ways to do this, but for the average Joe to get have a computer that just works with the TV is a great thing. Yep. I can see the, yep. I mean, see this, you know, the advantage of that. I mean, how many times have I showed people YouTube videos on my laptop in my living room, right, where everybody gathers around and huddles around a, a TV screen? It would be great to be able to hit a button and, and shoot it up to the TV and watch it that way, right? So it does do audio and video, so that's always good. Um, and it does do high-definition audio as well, I think, so... Also a positive. So I mean that this I mean the Y die, the push to TV, whatever you want to call it, is in a handful of laptops today. You can buy it today, or if not today, next week at Best Buy, um, and it does come with the Netgear. So we'll see other devices. We'll see other uh, notebooks from Intel and Intel's partners that will come out with the technology. I think it could be cool. I, I, I'm reading that the Netgear device sells for about $99, which is interesting because Intel I thought told it, me that. No, no, no. It, can't, it comes it with a laptop. With yeah, that's what Intel right. told me, too. But I'm wondering if they're selling it separately. If oh, of course another they are. How many TVs do you have? How many TVs uh, do you true. have? True. Yeah, you, right. you the, believe me. D-Link is going. <laughs> they're rubbing right. their hands together. They're saying, well, you got a TV in the living room. You got a TV in the bathroom. You got a TV in the bedroom. You got a TV. <laughs> so they'll give you one. First one's free. But of course, they're going to sell more of them. Yeah, that does make sense. That does make sense. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that was something that I thought was actually pretty cool that Intel showed off. Uh, I do see how there is there's obviously a lot of room for improvement, which is good for NVIDIA. That gives them something else to talk about next year at CES. When you can do 1080p and, you, you know, you can... Uh, watch your Blu-ray movies, any HDCP content, you can, you know, you can use your mouse, you can use it as a second monitor. That was, that was my first thought when they mentioned it was, oh, here's a great way to have a second monitor for a laptop without having to hook up cables, right? You just have the monitor on your desk, set your laptop down, hit your button, and you have a secondary display. It doesn't really work that way currently, though. Right. So, in the future. In the future... Sheep will be made of glass. No, that's another story. <laughs> All right. Why die? Poorly named. Thanks to Paul and Alini. Think of it as wireless display. Yes. We're going to come back in just a bit and talk about Aaron Dale and who you who may have that the first uh, 3D vision. AMD has a new notebook GPU. But first, it's time to mention our friends at Sync, the great voice activated Sync. Go to SyncMyRide.com. That's the website if you want to check it out, find out more. That's the website that those of us who have Sync, and I do in my 2010 Ford, uh, go there to download vehicle health reports, to configure Sync, download software updates, because every Sync-equipped vehicle has a USB port. I love this. They have an audio jack, so you could plug in anything with an audio out port, which means everything, I think. And then if you, if you have a device with the USB connection, like a iPod, iPhone, Zune, Droid, the Nexus One works with the Nexus One. I verified that. It, you connect up the USB port, and it charges the device, and it can read the MP3s on the device, indexes them, and then you can talk to the device. You can talk to your device. It's so cool. You can say, play next, play previous, play similar. You could say, uh, play track Yellow Submarine. You could say, play track PC Perspective. Play track twitch and it'll play those tracks uh it's just so cool this is a complete revolution in the way you interact with your car it's all done by voice so you never take your hands off the wheel there's a little button on the steering wheel you press to say i want to talk 
plays a little tone at at you, and then you just you just tell it what you want. You could say, yeah, climate temperature seventy four, and it does it. You keep your eyes on the road, your hands on the wheel, even as GPS turn by turn driving directions the whole the whole nine yards. Look, here's the way to see it. You can get a demo at SyncMyRide.com, but if you really want to figure out what it's all about, go to your local Ford, Lincoln, or Mercury dealer and say, I'd like to test drive the Sync. As you know, Ryan, they make it. A, Ford made a huge splash at CES. Yeah, they were all over the place down there. Yeah, they were the story of the show. In fact, the New York Times did a big Sunday piece on uh, Alan Mulally, mm. the uh, CEO of Ford. Um, this, you know, and talking about how he's how Ford is is kind of spearheading our economic recovery. I mean, this is really. I am so thrilled to be associated with Sync, and uh, you know, it's it's just a great match because we love technology. We don't want to get in the car and cut ourselves <laughs> off from the outside <laughs> no, world. That's and true. Now it's all there. SyncMyRide.com. Thank you so much, Sync, for bringing us to CES and for your support for the last couple of months on the network. We really appreciate it. Yep. Arendale and Clarkdale. Are those both notebook parts? No, Clarkdale is the desktop part. Of the same Ar species. Ar right. Arendale is the mobile part uh, based on the same architecture, the same die, the same technology. Got it. So uh, Arendale... Is it an i7, basically, for a notebook? Uh, i5s, essentially, are kind of what we'll see I5. Arendale's targeted okay. as. There will be some brand as i7, but I think, in the general sense, if we say Arendale i5, mobility core i5s, that's kind of what we're referring to. Um, what was interesting is we, we did a PC Perspective did a review of Arendale on January 3rd when the products were first kind of the NDA was released on them. Now... What I had actually written in my show notes for today, earlier this afternoon, was like, oh, this makes sense. Uh, we, we've often, I don't think I have heard anything about official invites going out for an Apple event at the end of the month. Have you No any invites. No, no invites. invites. But strong rumor that it will happen. Pretty right? strong. Still. You know, so, so much so that Andy Anatko of MacBreak Weekly in the Chicago Sun-Times has pur purchased his plane ticket. <laughs> <laughs> he's just, you know, he's taking That's, on faith. Uh, I said, that's pretty confident. No, I know. I said, good. I admire your faith in Steve Everlasting. Uh, I hope, uh, I, I would, I, you know, I personally would still make it a refundable ticket just in case. <laughs> I don't think he did. <laughs> but, uh, you know. <laughs> He's coming um, out by, by hook or by crook. But uh, I think it's going to happen. I think there's no doubt it's going to happen. My initial thing was, yeah. So if they have an event, it only makes sense that it, Apple would be updating their MacBook MacBook Pro line, I guess, of machines with this new Arendelle processor. Right now, they're still using Core 2 derivatives in uh, in their Macs, in their in their mobile Macs at least. And Core i5 Arendelle adds a lot to it. Now, I had kind of put this down to discuss it and theorize it earlier. And then about an hour before we went live, I got a word of a news post from uh, Apple Insider that they posted an email that was sent to members of in, Intel's Retail Edge promotional program. So that's mm. the people who work at Best Buy and those guys uh, get these emails from Intel about how to sell their products better. And it has uh, mentioned January prize draw, win a MacBook Pro uh, for your chance to win one of two MacBook, MacBook Pro laptops with the accelerated response of an Intel Core i5 processor. So there you go. It basically just said. So in that January, was. They, they basically win. did it. They basically said yeah. it. Yeah. So they, that's they, Aaron Dale. Accidentally. Yeah. Yeah. Until accidentally announced Whoops. that the new MacBooks are going to come out in January or some at some point. N not unpre not unprecedented because Intel usually uh, gives the first crack at these hot chips. The i7 was first in a Mac Pro. It's not unusual, right? right? No, no. Uh, what is uh, a little weird is that they might that they would ship new laptops at the same time as they might announce a slate. So maybe <laughs> wouldn't this be funny? Andy's going to fly out, and all they do is nap, announce new MacBooks. Uh, that that would be unfortunate, I think, for a lot of people who are who are getting really really excited. They can't do point. that at this point. If they're going to do that, they better start saying to people, "No, no, 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 no announcement." Because I'll tell you what: if we go there and they haven't told us that, and we come out and and we're sitting there, and they said. And, and 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 I've got three reporters in there: Andy Anatko, uh, Shira Lazar, and I, Justine. I've got Alex Lindsay and I in the in the in the control center. I've got Dane out front, Jason Snell of MacWorld Magazine, and they come out and they say there's a new iPod speaker. <laughs> I don't I don't want to be responsible for what happens. You know, it's the thing is the worst part about it is that's not that's not even fair to Apple. It's it's really not. You're 100 percent correct that there will be tons of people that will be upset and. And uh, 
like talking down about Apple. And, and so I bet I, it wouldn't surprise me if somebody says their inability to actually execute on something that they've never announced or really discussed in any official way. Um, but I, I, from a PC guy, I think it would be hilarious. From your perspective, I can see how it would not be. So <laughs> You would laugh. You would laugh would, at us Apple fanboys. No, yeah. That's all right. Not that I don't find the ideas involved intriguing and, and much like you, I'm kind of a gadget geek itself. And if it were actually new and interesting, I'd probably have to buy one anyway. Um, you guys are going to laugh. Drew in the Netherlands is saying they're going to announce that the iPod Touch now has a camera. Thanks. We'll see you later. Oh, and one more thing. There's new MacBook Pros. Thanks. We'll see you later. And we're going to go, what? <laughs> I, I've also heard about maybe faster, uh, faster iPhones as well. Rumors of uh, just faster processors and, and, and that kind of stuff. But they, they wouldn't set up an event for that, I wouldn't think. Well, but we don't know if they're it's, having an event. There is no confirmed event. That's true. Again. Well, hey, if nothing else, you'll have a nice visit from Andy. <laughs> that's what he said. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I told him he could stay upstairs. There you go. <laughs> in the green room. That's a good idea. I like I'll put that. a cot in there for him. <laughs> <laughs> now, keep in mind what's interesting. The only, thing, only other thing I would say is, is that these obviously uh, coming soon MacBooks with Core i5 is that they would have to have a discrete GPU in them. Now, the, the, one of the big benefits of Arendelle is that it integrates graphics onto the chip, onto the processor. So uh, it's a cost savings benefit for most other vendors. They can sell a laptop that has graphics and a processor in a single, single package, not on a single die, but on a single package. Um, with relatively good performance for non-gaming applications, it does support some basic uh, uh, YouTube flash type decode acceleration and that kind of stuff. Huh. But because Apple has thrown all of its weight behind OpenCL and right. uh, integrating that into Snow Leopard and all that kind of stuff, the Intel HD graphics, which is what they're calling the integrated part in there, doesn't support OpenCL. So they would still have to have a discrete GPU solution from NVIDIA, most likely, maybe ATI. Uh, if that would, that would be kind of revolutionary news for us. But they would have to have some kind of discrete solution in order for it to really exist yeah. and not completely buckle their product line. Yeah. And then when you get into adding a discrete solution... The benefits of Arendelle in terms of uh, power consumption and battery life are a little bit more muted. You still get some performance benefits, but uh, you know a lot. One of the big, one of the big drawing points of Arendelle is is you know better performance, same battery life, because they integrate graphics in such a way. But something to keep in mind as we get in through the rest of January for sure. Now, okay. I was, well, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? No, Any, I'm, uh, done. <laughs> no. <Okay. laughs> I'm done. Now, I'm done. I'm not going to buy was... another laptop until I hear. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a good idea. Yeah, I, I've got this MacBook, and if it does, if the new ones don't come with a uh, a um, is Arendelle that PC much better? Car. Actually, that's a good question. Is Arendelle that much better? So it's worth waiting for. Uh, in the mobile front, I believe it is. Okay, because you're getting a. It's a dual core processor. It's hyper threaded, so you get four threads. Uh, it's running 32 nanometers, so you get that same performance at or about the same power. Uh, so you get uh, you get better performance at or about the same power levels and battery levels and that kind of stuff. It does, uh, because of the smaller thermal envelope, potentially without discrete graphics, um, you could build thinner machines, lighter machines that are more powerful than current generation if you don't necessarily have to integrate discrete graphics. So for non-Apple-based machines, if we look at HPs and we look at Dells, there's a good opportunity for them to improve performance on the exact same packages that they have built now, the exact same uh, system designs, or to you know, uh, keep the same performance but lower the system size, the weight, increase battery life, that type of thing. Uh, I, I was really impressed with the Westmere architecture, which is what Arendelle is made from, I, I was much more impressed with it in the mobile form factor than I was the desktop form factor. Whereas in the desktop form factor where power isn't necessarily an issue, you know, it just was just kind of barely eclipsing the Core 2 Quad and Core 2 Duo processors of, you know, yesteryear. I have to, to say, say, I've been very impressed with the CULV parts. I have, we have two mm -hmm. Dell laptops now with, uh, and they're only 1.6 gigahertz, but they just seem, right. they seem fairly snappy. They're, they're definitely they're more snappy than what you get with Atom, which yeah. is kind of, you know, CULVs are going to be a little bit larger than netbooks that use Atoms. 
but they're going to be a little bit smaller than the notebooks course, that use right. Westmere. Right. So, I mean, Westmere will go up to uh, 2.8, 2.9 gigahertz, I think. So, uh, you're going to, you're definitely going to see a speed boost. But again, depending on what your workload is on this mobile form factor, CULVs are, are, are a very, very good option. So, so moving no along, NVIDIA yes. has something new. This was something else I don't think we talked about last week because I didn't get a chance to see it until later in the week, was the NVIDIA Surround. And this is their answer to AMD iFinity. So iFinity being the multi-monitor gaming solutions that they came out with last year in their Radeon 5000 series of cards. You could connect three monitors up to a single graphics card and span your game across all three displays. And they're still planning on coming out with a six card or six display graphics card as well. Obviously, you need a little bit more money to, to, to have all the monitors for that. But um, we'd often wondered, we'd, I'd had some talks with NVIDIA, you know, behind closed doors talking about it and saying, look, you guys, this is, this is kind of revolutionizing PC gaming. This is one of those things that's really making PC gaming stand out from console gaming. This is something you can't do on a console. What is your answer going to be to this? And they said, look, it wouldn't be difficult for us to come up with this technology because we already do something similar to this in our high-end Quadro workstation uh, cards. So the high-end cards that people do 3D rendering, they were kind of already supporting multi-display 3D with it. So now they have officially announced their version of it. It's called NVIDIA Surround. And they even have support. This is actually kind of cool. They're, they're calling it 3D Vi NVIDIA 3D Vision Surround. And so this actually would be three panels, so three 1080p panels that run on 120 hertz each that will do 3D vision gaming on it. So uh, we've, we've talked about 3D vision before. That's the, the active 3D gaming solution where you wear gl shuttered glasses that you know, alternate your eyes back and forth. You have to have 120 hertz monitors so that you get 60 frames per eye, so it's relatively smooth. Um, well, they're going to support that across three displays. Now, which is actually really cool. We got to see it running. Anybody who went to the to the NVIDIA booth could see it running both in, in a 720p projector form and in 1080p 22-inch monitor form as well. And it was, actually, it was actually really, really, really cool looking. If you had ever experienced 3D vision before and you thought it was it looked good, I think you'll be impressed when you see it across three displays. I think we saw it with um, a couple that, of upcoming games. That's going to be pretty amazing, systems. yeah. Yeah, now, I, only, I think that gaming is. They're, they're, we talked about this, I guess, on the on the CES show. But there's only mm -hmm. really two compelling use cases for me: is gaming and sports, right? For 3D, and for gaming, yep. a three screen 3D setup. Yeah, baby, bring it on. <laughs> I agree. When I mean, you sit there and you're and and it was watching. I forget what I was playing. Shift, Need for Speed Shift. It was very very cool to to have this yeah. just super elongated display. My only problem was I in my affinity testing locally here at the office tend to prefer the monitors to be wrapped around me just a little bit as opposed to them being uh, perfectly flat, you know, uh, tilt the side monitors at a little bit of an angle. And I, in looking through all the setups, NVIDIA didn't have anything like that working, which makes me believe, leads me to believe at least that 3D vision, the way the monitors work, the way the, the way the glasses work, um, the way the infrared signal back and forth between them works, it, it's it's possible that tilting the side monitors would force, would maybe break the illusion of the three-dimensional image that you're seeing through these glasses. Uh, I also know that because you actually have physical glasses on, I mean, there's there's a point where the, where, where the lens stops, right? There's a point on the side of your face where the lens stops and your peripheral vision is there when there's no... You know, there's no there's no switching lens at that point, and if the image and if the screen wraps too far around you, then you get into that problem where the glasses either block that from your view or the image shows up behind the glasses oh, and it's yeah. not in 3D. So you need wraparounds. Uh, so yeah, we'd have to have even nerdier looking glasses. <laughs> well, no, I mean you could look like Bono. Dead. Yeah, well, and actually, I, I think there's a technical limit to that is that they can't make that glass flexible or they can't uh, make it, they can't oh. curve it in such a way because it is oh. essentially a one pixel LCD monitor oh. in each lens. Oh. Um, I don't know if they have the ability to wrap that 
around you very well and if it would increase the cost and you know the glasses are already pretty pricey we think about a 200 dollars accessory for gaming plus the cost of your monitors and that stuff so if it increases the cost of the glasses they, they probably are really hesitant to do it which would be another reason maybe why they made it perfectly flat when it's perfectly flat you know your your peripheral doesn't peripheral vision doesn't really come into play quite as often um, but if you're doing the non 3D version, I would imagine you'd be able to wrap it around just as just as easily. So uh, it's it's cool. Um, there are a couple limitations to it that they were you know kind of show they weren't showing obviously, but we could tell you know like I said, AMD can do three displays off a single graphics card, and you can get a single high performance 5870 card, run three 2560 by 1600 panels, and you'll be good to go. NVIDIA will apparently require you to have two cards to run multi-monitor gaming uh, because each graphics card only supports two display outputs. So if you want to have three monitors, obviously that means you need to have at least a second card. Uh, that does put it at a disadvantage in terms of pricing, right? So uh, you have to have a secondary card in addition to your third monitors. But that will also allow you to use or allow customers to use Three display or three um, dual link DVI monitors, as opposed to having to have. Or one of the big problems with Ifinity was that it required at least one DisplayPort monitor, which are relatively new, harder to find, a little bit more expensive than just DVI based monitors. So with Nvidia's solution, you would have to buy a second card, but you could buy cheaper displays. So a little bit of offset there. Um, they. Or obviously, if you have two uh, two cards, you can run it in SLI, so you should get better performance anyway. And also, I tend to think anybody who's going to set up three monitors for gaming is probably going to be okay with the idea of having SLI in their system as opposed to just one single graphics card. I realize it's a little bit more money, a little bit more kind of installation hassle and that kind of stuff as well. But I think I think if we're talking about the gamers that are that really want Nvidia or really want surround gaming, whether that be from NVIDIA or ATI or for whoever, uh, they are comfortable with PC gaming in its current status, right? Where you kind of have to pay a little bit more, sometimes a lot more than console gaming to get this improved experience. So I don't know if you'll be buying any... Uh, Not NVIDIA me. Surround systems, Hell no. But I, I, you know, well, you've got enough monitors there. We could probably make it work. <laughs> I could fake it. Right I, there. Uh, yeah, no, I think it's for the hardcore person, especially once you talk, talk start is. talking about that additional cost and so forth. It's yeah. it's just, you know, it's another one of those things. There'll be people who buy it just like they buy $500 GPUs. Yep, definitely. definitely. Speaking of which, AMD's got a new GPU for the notebook. Yeah, now this uh, I did bring on the show last week, but I wanted to, to bring up a couple of other points. This was the, I, first of all, I forgot to actually name it during the show. It's called the AMD XGP. It's an external notebook GPU. So I showed it last week. I won't go over all the details again, but what I there are some interesting things that I didn't know at the time. It, first of all, it supports five outputs, five what, what monitors. What does that mean? So it mean five monitors? You could hook five monitors up to this external device. To a laptop? Right. So again, for people who maybe didn't hear last week, this, is, this was an external box that sits outside your laptop. You know, maybe, uh, the, you know, six, eight inches across, two inches deep, two inches wide, or six inches wide, that type of deal. Basically, it looks like the size of a, of a discrete graphics card. And it connected to a laptop through a custom cable. It was a, a PCI Express by 8 connection. And on this external box, you had some USB ports, you had a power plug, and then you had display outputs. You had, I think you had HDMI, three display port, and a DVI connection if I can remember correctly, and all five of those can be run at the same time. So when we're talking about iFinity, this is another application of iFinity where you can have up to five displays running on a single graphics card. And in this case, the single graphics card happens to be connected to a notebook computer, uh, which is really kind of compelling in a lot of different ways. Obviously, you have the gaming aspects. You just have the, the ability to do multi-monitor multitasking and that kind of stuff while you're at home. And then you can just disconnect that external adapter, leave all the monitors hooked up to it, and take your, you know, thin and light notebook with you on the go. Um, it, the, the, the unfortunate part is it still does require a custom laptop right now. Only one, only one notebook offers this connection. It's a, an Acer Ferrari notebook, so it's going to be a little bit expensive. 
if you can only tell by the branding. Uh, but they will have other ones coming out soon, although it, it's tough to, to tell how many. They wouldn't give us any numbers, which is usually a bad sign. I am still hopeful that they will offer like a, a PCI or PC card adapter for it. You know, something, you know, your express card slot. Maybe you have that connection on it as well. Uh, because I think, I think it's compelling to have a notebook maybe the size of this ThinkPad that has a reasonable processor and it's got a Core 2 Duo, but it's thin and like it's eight hours of battery if I, if, I, if I want it to, but it doesn't do gaming. There's no reason that the processor in this machine isn't fast enough to do gaming. It's the graphics that's not fast enough. If, you, if I had an external unit that I could plug in and game either locally on this monitor or on external displays, I think that's compelling of uh, a compelling upgrade for three hundred, four hundred dollars, whatever it is. You can have one machine that you can do real hardcore gaming. You hook your monitor up, you hook your keyboard, your mouse, and it's like gaming on a on a normal desktop PC because you are using such a you're using a reasonably powerful graphics card. You can even do the things like multi display gaming if you want to. But then if you want to go on the road, you want to take the machine downstairs. You simply unplug one cable, and you're done. You know something you cannot do with a desktop. <clears throat> that you cannot do with a desktop computer today. And if you want a game on a laptop today, you're usually um, relegated to be getting or to, to buying a 16-inch, a, a 17-inch monitor-based laptop that will get, you know, at most an hour and a half to two hours of battery life if you're lucky. That's big, it's hot, it's heavy because they have to include the graphics inside the machine. So with an external option, I think that, allows for a lot more flexibility. Um, no idea on pricing. I would expect this to be something like three or $400. Hopefully we'll see more notebooks integrate a connection like this or have uh, AMD actually at least like a PCI or express card type solution for it as well. So I, I'm curious, I mean, do you think, what do you think about the idea of having a laptop that can do both as opposed to no, I think you it's a great idea. Machine. I mean, there's I, a lot of people who remember shuttle shuttles sold, sold a lot of computers on the premise that you would bring it to a land party, right? So right. if you can get it, the, and the you know historical problem with laptops is just lack of GPU power. So yep. even if it's an external GPU, which is kind of a wacky idea, but uh, this I think it's a great idea. I think there's going to be a market for people who want to go to land parties or want to game with their buddies. And they bring yep. along their laptop and their little GPU box. And boy, the fact they could do five screens. I mean, it's odd when you think five screens and portable. You, they don't they don't seem to go right. they don't seem to go together. Right. You know, well, but I mean that's what I'm saying. You you leave that you leave that at home. It's at home. Right. Hooked up to your monitor, hooked right. up to your key, external keyboard and mouse. And when you want to when you want to play a game, even if it's just a single player game, right. even if it's not going over somebody's house, you can simply Plug that in Why and go. Not? I got no problem and with that. I mean, the, the the CPUs in laptops are fast enough. It's been a GPU right. issue, right? So, yes, the games uh, this are still that. definitely GPU limited. Right, so this solves that. And of course, you still have that other option, which I thought was really cool personally. Uh, the external box also had the ability to render graphics and push them back inside the system to be displayed on your primary monitor. So if you did want to do... Oh, I didn't understand buddies, that. So you still get an internal monitor that has all that, that speed as well. Right. So oh, if you want to game that's at good. your friend's house, you, you can bring your laptop in that box and disconnect all the external monitors hooked up to it. And then it will push the gaming power of that graphics card in that box onto your built-in uh, laptop display. Mm -hmm. So even though this is a 12-inch screen, it's not ideal. If I wanted to go somewhere, if I was going out of town, I could still game yeah. on it. I would love that. With the keyboard and external mouse. I think mouse. that's great. I mean, yeah. look, we're, we're all headed towards laptops. Uh, you know, and right. one of the last reasons to keep a desktop is for gaming. So if you can get that kind of True. performance in a laptop, why not? And I love I the agree. idea of having these machines with it built in. Yeah. I mean, that's very interesting. Yep. Why, why not just, um, I mean, this maybe this is stupid, but why not just put in a, a GPU that's got all that horsepower? Why does it have to be an MXM? Well, the, the MXM is actually the form factor... Uh, of of like a discrete graphics card into okay. a notebook system. So it's not an ad, it's not like a PC card add-on. It's inside it's not, it's, and it's how you would put a a, a, a separate graphics adapter. In. Right. So they basically are just taking the the GPU that exists inside a notebook and moving it external, adding a little bit more cooling to it. Perhaps that's the uh, issue, isn't it? it? Cooling and power because you're putting this inside. Exactly. Cooling and power, spacing, design. Uh, when you get it, when you get if you 
because the requirement is if you put a GPU somewhat even close, even a close proximity in speed and performance to what's in this external box in the system, you couldn't design a system this size for it because you'd have to, you know, the designer has to make sure you're not going to fry your system. So it has to have all the necessary cooling, heat sinks and fans in there in order to properly, you know, ventilate the heat out of the system, even when you are using it. So, you know, gaming laptops tend to be bigger, heavier, uh, much less portable, much lower battery life. So moving that as a completely external, separately powered item saves a lot of that. So that, I mean, the Acer Ferrari notebook that they had had hooked up to, it was like a 13 inch laptop. It was relatively small, relatively light. Uh, had a reasonable processor in it, which you would want for gaming, but then just had a little plug-in for, for the graphics solution. Now, it obviously, it still has an internal graphics, but it's much lower power, you know, used for your, you know, watching, streaming video and, and doing all your 3D window stuff and all that kind of deal. But for gaming, it's just nice to be able to take that part out, remove it from the whole equation where the, the vendor, the OEM, the ODM doesn't have to worry about designing for it, you know. We we're, we're we just finished testing a, a one of Asus's newest best gaming laptops, but it's still a 15.6 inch screen. And it still weighs about nine pounds Yikes. and all this other kind of stuff. But so, I, mean, I it's have not to say, I want to carry around CES. How, how many desktops did you see at CES? I mean, how many people were showing off new desktops? I guess well, Alienware was there, but I mean, Main Gear was there. Um, but not very many. No, it's. I mean, we're going to laptops. Let's face it. So that makes sense yep. that these guys are planning for laptop gaming. Yep, agreed. That's what I. So hopefully doing. the stand. Hopefully the connection will become more standard, or a connection will become more standard. And what I would like to see is an external box, not even necessarily made by AMD, but made by Dell or somebody that connects to all of Dell's laptops, and then you can actually take that box, open that box, and and change out the graphics card in it when you want to upgrade as opposing to having to buy a whole new system or something like that, which I, I think is, is very doable the way MXM modules work and, and, and how these devices are cooled. And if it's an external unit that's externally powered, I don't see any reason why that wouldn't happen. Speaking of gaming, uh, have you had more chance to look at OnLive? Was OnLive at CES? OnLive was not at CES, uh, but I had been, I got access to a beta account on it and I have been playing around with it and we've actually we've got some videos we've taken of it that are being edited and a write-up that I need to do before this weekend on it and I just kind of wanted to touch on a couple of keys about it um, in my experiences with it playing through a handful of games one it actually works much better than I thought it was going to so on live for anybody who didn't know is the streaming game service so it's basically the game is rendered and run on an, uh, on an external server somewhere off in the cloud. And it's basically sending you an image, a video of the game being played. And then it sends back your mouse movements, your keyboard movements, uh, your keyboard commands, anything like that, back to the server. And that's how you interact with the game. So you never install, the only thing you install locally is like a 7 or 8 meg plugin. Right? And, and uh, you're good to go. You can, you can start any game that's available on the service. Um, you don't have to install any uh, local files or anything like that. It works. It works very well from a user experience standpoint. I guess I'll say. Um, you know, I installed it. I turned it on. It just worked. Uh, well, it's got it. That's the minimum. <laughs> it's got to do that. Yes, <laughs> it works. It works. Uh, it has. You know, the, when you when you select a game to load, it takes you know thirty to sixty seconds, which is probably less than the time that it would take most games to load on a local PC. Um, you know, you can move in and out of games very easily. It's kind of uh, like being in a DVR, essentially, but for games instead of for TV. You know, you can bring up a separate menu uh, and exit out of a game and select a, select a different one really, really quickly and easily on the fly. It stores all your save games locally and that kind of stuff. It uh, works works very well. What I will say about it before I, I do our finish our write up is that it worked very differently for different types of games. And this is kind of what I expected. Now, in, in, in defense of on live service, I think this beta is only supposed to be happening in the Southern California, Northern California area. So when I'm connecting from Cincinnati, it's running slower. It, it, it warns me that my latency is a little bit higher than it would like, but it still lets me play on the service. Now, 
I don't know. It doesn't give you an actual ping. It doesn't give you any kind of visual indicator of, of as to what That's your latency is. Yeah. Um, but what I will say is that I played Burnout Paradise, which is a kind of a fun racing destruction game. And I played Tom Clancy's Hawks, which is kind of an arcade-ish flight sim game. And both of those games played very well. And whereas I brought, I brought, I brought Ken, who was out at CES with us, who edits our podcast and our video and that kind of stuff. And I brought him in to the office and I just said, oh, here, play. Uh, I want you to try playing out, playing Burnout on this. You know, I, I kind of posed it to him that it, I didn't tell him it was on live. I wanted him to not know that he was playing on the on live service. And so he played it for 10 minutes or something like that. And when I asked him what he thought, he said, yeah, it seems pretty good. I, was, I basically told him we were evaluating the graphics on that laptop that it was connected to. Hmm. And he said, yeah, it was playing pretty good. And I said, well, that was on OnLive. And he said he couldn't tell. Really? Wow. So that, yeah, so that's good. That's neat. And we had, this, we had the same, same result with Hawks, right? Uh, couldn't really tell that you were on it. Couldn't tell the difference. If you had them side by side, maybe on a, on a local machine and on OnLive, you could kind of tell that there was a little bit of a, a delay in what your uh, controls you were inputting versus what you're seeing on the screen. But however, on Unreal Tournament 3, it was awful. Uh, so oh. Unreal Tournament 3 being a very fast-paced shooter. Uh, was it latency it was, that was hurting? Yeah. So basically moving so the, the image mouse, looked good. It's just you couldn't Sure. Couldn't the, Im play. the image coming through was 720p, and it was reasonable. It was latency. It was mm. in a first-person shooter where it's very Twitch-oriented. Right. No pun intended based on the name of the show. But, you know, it's, it's very quick movements. It was easy to see the lag involved in online gaming. Uh, I did notice every, I tried it, that was with a mouse and keyboard. I also tried it with a, an Xbox gamepad, a USB gamepad, and I was able to play the game much better with the gamepad than I was with the mouse and keyboard. So I'm not sure exactly what that means. I think that means that people playing with a gamepad are used to a little bit more lag, delay type of slow response. With the mouse, you're used to be able to quickly move and swing your character around type of deal, whereas when you're using an Xbox controller, you usually have to hold to the right a little bit as you rotate, and it takes a little bit longer. Um, so that's all very subjective, and that's kind of all why, why it's taking a little bit longer and to write it up. That makes sense, though, that the, the uh, latency would be an issue, that the rendering would look good. It might be great for games like uh, real-time strategy games, uh, like exactly. Age of Empires. Might be, I mean, of course, it'd be great for that. It'd be fine for uh, World of Warcraft, perhaps. Yep, but Unreal Tournament, you could see why, you know. Right, and that and that's kind of why. I mean, there are some other games on. There's they have like 14 games you can play, and there's some strategy games, and there's some turn-based games, which obviously make the most sense in that kind of stuff. But I would have to say, in terms of how, I guess I would say I wasn't looking forward to it. I didn't. I had no trust. I had no faith in the idea <laughs> of it. No really. trust. No faith. I came away probably 75 cent, 75 percent impressed, where it worked. It looked okay. It looked decent. Um, I will say I did try it once from the office when we were having a lot of bandwidth issues, maybe similar to what we had today. Um, but it, when it would let me connect, you know how when you're watching the, the Twit live stream, how sometimes bandwidth will kind of chug and it will go blurry right. and then it will come back. Right. That's exactly what happens hmm. when you hit a bandwidth bubble in the game. Right. right? We had a couple sense. times where it would freeze and then it would come back. Just, just anything that you can expect to see through a Flash video stream like, you're, like we're watching on Twit Live now. It's not Flash, though, is it? I, I, I can't tell. It's, it's very streaming. Light. It's, it's streaming. Um, you know, it could be Flash. I didn't even think of that. They could be you know, re-rendering it. They could it as, be using Flash. Yeah. I never thought uh, I was able to take videos of it, recording it what's with fraps. This, what's sure. your local CPU uh, consumption look like? Uh, it's relatively low. Okay, it's that's, not, that's definitely not Flash. Oh, okay. <laughs> Remember, yeah. you know, Flash just pegs your, pegs your CPUs. True, true, true. true. And um, there are... There Might are, be Silverlight. I could see it being Silverlight. Yeah, you, so I'm trying to think. It doesn't give you any really indications. It doesn't tell you... Right. Like, I expected in a beta to get, like, a latency meter and a bandwidth meter and this other kind of stuff, but they don't... They don't have any of that. Anything. They yeah. don't want you to know, no. essentially. Which, no. obviously, in the end, they don't want people to have to worry about it. You know, that's kind of one of the complaints about PC gaming in general. So, One more story, the Hydra. Yeah, this one is also kind of, a, uh, I'll give you a quick preview overview of something that we're writing up the, this, this week as well, and that is results from the first Hydra motherboard that we've been talking about for a while. This is the ability to, it's a, it's a new chip, 
It goes on a motherboard that allows you to scale between different GPUs of the same vendor. So you can have an NVIDIA GTX 285 and install an NVIDIA GTX 260, and you would see some performance scaling between those two. Same on the AMD side. But then more interesting was the inter-vendor scaling, being able to have a Radeon 5870 and a GTX 285 and see them work together to produce better frame rates and higher performance uh, as opposed to, you know, not being able to work together at all. Uh, overall, I have to say I was a little disappointed in this result as well. The compat there are a lot of compatibility issues. Uh, there are several instances where performance did not scale at all. If anything, it scaled the wrong direction in the negative um, versus a single card. You know, where it did work well is in the NVIDIA on NVIDIA. So if you had a, a high-end NVIDIA card and you up you had just upgraded from like an older NVIDIA card, you could keep that card in there and get, you know, 10, 15, 20% better performance out of your system, which is, I mean, that's free performance that you would have been throwing away otherwise because NVIDIA doesn't support combining those two cards. So that, that worked pretty well. And same thing with the AMD side. Uh, if you had a 4800 card and you bought a 5800 card, you could combine those and get some performance scaling out of it as well. But the inter-vendor stuff didn't really work very well. There were a couple of instances where it scaled well, a couple of instances where it scaled poorly, and a couple of instances where it just didn't work at all. The game had corruption and this kind of stuff. So while I, I think the technology still has a chance, I, and I still... I'm a big proponent of it, at least the idea, the theory of it. Uh, they, they definitely need some more work on the software side. So, uh, But we'll be doing a full, again, we'll be doing another write-up of that coming up this week as well. All this delayed because of CES. So, <laughs> And exhaustion. The exhaustion and, and that, that follows too. CES. Yeah, yeah. I fell asleep quite early today. I thought I'd be screwed up <laughs> oh, yeah. the other direction and I'd oh, be up no, to like exhausting. nine. But. Oh, it's exhausting, yeah. Well, great stuff. I'm glad to uh, check back in with you. It's interesting to hear about laptop gaming. It's an ascendancy. I'm looking forward to the Arendale. Mm -hmm. uh, why die? <laughs> 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 and all the hardware. You read more about this and everything we've talked about at PC Perspective. That's PCPer.com. And catch Ryan as we do this show every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern. That's uh, 3 p.m. Pacific time, 2100 UTC at live.twit.tv. And stay tuned because... In a couple of hours, Ryan's back with the PPDC Perspective of Podcast, which is at mm -hmm. 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific time, right here at live.twit.tv with Colleen Kelly and the gang. That's right. All right. Have a great night, Ryan. We'll see you next time on This Week in Computer Hardware.